I want to welcome you to our, our, our lovely law school on this nice warm day. Um, we are, are very pleased and excited that you're here for a, an inaugural event. This is the first ever symposium of our uh, uh, K journal, as we call it affectionately at the law school. Um, the, the faculty sponsor of that journal is Mark Keitlinger, who's sitting out here in the audience. Uh, we also have the editor in chief, um, Connor Egan, who's also sitting next to him. Uh, and, and, and two of the people involved in, in making this event happen are Dylan Nichols, executive development editor, who's out executive development right now, <laughs> and, uh, and Thomas Travis, uh, the, uh, also the executive editor of, of the journal. So uh, I, I think that the students have put a lot of work into this, and I, I thank our speakers for being here, and thank you for being here at our law school. Um, as I said, this is the first ever symposium for this particular journal. Um, we have two journals here at the law school, and this is what we call the specialty journal. So students who are interested in, in agricultural law, equine law, natural resources law are, are participants in this journal. Um, and I think that that's one of the distinguishing factors of our law school. Um, you know, when people think of Lexington, they think of our law school, they often associate us with these areas of law. And so it's great that we have an opportunity to show that association in this very unique way. Uh, as, as a faculty, uh, we are working to try to create some other opportunities to focus on this area uh, by, by zeroing in on one aspect of that, and that's equine law. And you'll hear more about that later on. Uh, given that this is a new thing for the journal to do symposiums, I've been told that they actually created a new position within the journal structure for this. So um, the position that Dylan Nichols holds is a brand new position for the uh, journal, uh, both in terms of doing things like this, in terms of putting on symposia, but also in terms of connecting with alumni of the law school who were formerly on the journal. So those of you who are alumni who used to be on this journal in law school, you should be receiving some communications in the near future about other ways that you can become re-engaged with the journal uh, that you used to be on. Um, you know, our law school uh, has, has been around for, for quite a while. Um, as you know, legal education is undergoing some uh, transform transformational evolutionary changes um, over the past several years. The number of folks applying to law school over the past five years has decreased by about 40%. Uh, so there's a lot fewer people applying to law school, but this is not atypical. Uh, law school applications ebb and flow over time, and we're in one of the sort of down periods of, of, of that period of, of applications. Uh, luckily, though, our law school, uh, because of its strength, has remained strong throughout uh, this down period in terms of applications. Our enrollment has not dropped significantly, but it has dropped, um, but, but less than uh, some other law schools. Uh, but the key thing to note is that our, our two key outputs have remained strong. Our employment rate is very high, above, nine, above uh, in the uh, nine, uh, top 10% of all law schools throughout the country. Our bar passage remains at 90% or above on a consistent basis. Um, and we think that that's a tribute to the quality of the students that, that enroll in the law school and the hard work that they put into um, being successful in terms of what they want to accomplish. And, and many of those students serve on this journal. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. I just wanted to welcome you here to the law school. Um, I have other commitments, so I will be here doing the symposium uh, presentations today, but I'll be with you in spirit. And also, I understand that we are being live streamed. So uh, those of you who have to um, leave for part of the program, uh, you can look at it on your computers. And if you go to our website, you'll be able to find out how to do that. So thank you and welcome. And uh, let's see. I guess Mr. Nichols is still uh, developing. So he's still developing. He's still developing. <laughs> so we're going to get started here very shortly. Okay. I have a sanction. Uh, good morning. I'm Tom Rutledge. I'm going to serve as the moderator of this morning session, which means I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. 
Wanted to say a few words first about the, the journal. Uh, the Kentucky Journal of Equine Agriculture and Natural Resources Law is a particular resource. It's unlike most law journals, which are publishing everything from commentary on securities regulation to employment law to Supreme Court jurisprudence and conflicts of laws. This is a journal that is focused upon the particular needs of particular industries and it is responsive to their concerns. It allows a place for scholarship of these particular foci to be collected, to be reviewed, and to be made available. It allows them to receive a voice that they might not otherwise have in the general journals. And I therefore think it's a very important uh, publication uh, addressing topics that otherwise would just be lost in the flurry of efforts to have things published. The journal has undergone a number of changes over the years, both in its focus and consequently in its title. Uh, when I was here at the law school, it was called the Journal of Mineral Law and Policy. And quite honestly, I never looked at it because mineral law doesn't interest me. Um, but it's, it's expanded over time. It started to include a focus upon the developments, the requirements of the agricultural industry. Um, most recent expansion was the addition of the equine to the name. There was a time when the Kentucky Law Journal itself was publishing and often have symposia on just equine law. Now that's been moved out of the general journal and moved into the more particular journal, again providing a forum for those who are interested in the area as attorneys, as counselors, and also a place where those who are participating in the industry can know that here is a place I get information that is high quality, that is particular to what I need. The journal has also undergone a shift over the years, completed most recently uh, uh, about a decade ago, to where the journal is now student driven. And this means that they, they have much more ownership in the product that's coming out, the attention to what is being accepted for publication, prepared for publication, and released. And I think that's an important aspect of the law school experience is developing the ability to understand that some of the stuff that will be provided for publication doesn't deserve publication. It's not of a level of quality that people want to be reviewing. Uh, other things do. Uh, I'm told that there's actually information on the internet that's not accurate. And this is just the expansion of the ability to siphon, I'm sorry, to um, separate and collate what is and is not valuable. And I hope that this inaugural symposium will raise the attention given to the journal and see to its broader application around the country. Let me briefly introduce the people who will be presenting to us this morning on these topics. I'm going to share just a couple ruminations on regulatory law in general from the perspective of somebody who does not practice traditional regulatory law, though I do practice <coughs> securities law, which is a topic I know Ms. D'Angelo will be talking about later. Uh, professor Jill Snow, to my right, is an associate professor at the Department of Agricultural Economics, and she directs the University of Kentucky Agricultural College's equine programs. Her area of specialization include the economics of the equine industry, decision making, under risk and uncertainty, I'm looking forward to finding out a bit more what that means. Uh, regulatory preferences, incentives, and neuroeconomics. She holds her PhD in economics from Texas A&M University. To her right is uh, Robert Hellringer. He's a um, expert in equine regulatory law and has actually written a book on the topic. His practice in the I'm sorry, I'm mixing up names. <laughs> you're, mixing, you're mixing me up. Joining us now. Dramatic <laughs> interest. Uh, he also has uh, spent 23 years in the Kentucky General Assembly, where he was an advocate for the horse racing industry. Try this again. My apologies. Uh, Robert Beck is a transactional attorney with Stites and Harbison here in Lexington, uh, where he has largely devoted his practice to the equine industry, sale and syndication of horses, etc. Uh, 
He is also the chair of the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission, having been appointed recently by Governor Bashir to a third term in that role. To my left is Laura D'Angelo, a partner with Dinsmore and Scholl here in Louisville, I'm sorry, here in Lexington, and also a graduate of UK's law school. In addition, she holds an MBA from York University in Canada. Uh, Laura is a nationally known equine attorney who as well teaches the class here at the university from time to time. In just a moment, Jill will be our first presenter. I was thinking when asked to speak here today, moderate here today, which again, I'm still not sure what that is, um, about regulatory law. The focus, of course, here is on issues of natural resources, of the equine industry, et cetera, all of which are crucial to the Kentucky economy. Um, but I was also thinking about what regulation does and what it doesn't do. It seems that one of the purposes of regulation should be to avoid the externalization of cost that should be internalized in a particular industry, a particular transaction. Now, none of us is probably going to stand up and say, I am in favor of air pollution, and I think it's perfectly fine to be drinking water laced with mercury. At the same time, we have the supposed uh, war on coal, which aims to reduce air pollution and mercury in products. Uh, this reminds me of the rule I learned from former Dean Vestal here at the law school. Where you stand depends on where you sit. What matters to you depends on what client interest you are representing from time to time. I also think it's interesting to look at regulation from the perspective of market barriers. When does a regulation, for the benefit of the industry, actually serve to protect people in the industry from competition. The saddlebred industry, to my understanding, is able to survive and thrive, allowing artificial insemination of mares. But of course, that is verboten in the thoroughbred industry. I wonder if this is merely a mechanism to ensure a continued line of business for the breeding farms of this industry uh, versus something that has actual benefit to uh, the industry as a whole and those who enjoy it. Now, this is not just the equine industry. Many industries have barriers that they have created. Uh, the alcoholic distribution industry, the car sales industry, the distribution of heavy farm equipment. In many states have laws that say, we have the right to distribute your product. How do we know that? Because we have your sign out front. And you cannot take that right away from us, or you can only take that right away from us after satisfaction of onerous conditions, like paying us many years of the profit we would have derived and giving us many years' notice. This is regulation, one person's concept. Another person is this is simply law that protects cartel conduct at a particular level. The alcoholic beverage industry is famous for this. Uh, as evidenced by the recent debates over uh, wine imports by consumers from wineries in other states. Well, who resist all these laws? Well, the domestic wholesalers, because they wanted a piece of that sale. And if you buy a bottle of wine from California, from Darius, it is shipped to you. You won't be buying that same bottle of wine because you probably don't drink two a night. Uh, from the local uh, liquor store, which was serviced by that wholesale. Yes, we need to keep people from under 21 from drinking alcohol, and that has benefits, uh, but that was not the purpose of the regulation as well. Right now, every business in the country is faced with regulations that have been proposed under the Bank Secrecy Act, which would require banks to collect information on the beneficial ownership of companies that are setting up bank accounts. If you read these proposed regulations, they exist to preclude people using business entities for international narcotics trade and the financing of terrorism. Which means that if your client is going to open up a deli here in Lexington, you have to fill out special forms, incur additional transactional costs, to make sure that they are not selling cocaine and supporting Hamas. I find the 
these regulations curious because I'm pretty sure that the people who import cocaine and to support terrorist activities are going to be more than willing to make up information and lie on a form filled out to the bank as to who controls the company that's importing cocaine and supporting terrorism. Regulation is good if it helps you. Regulation is bad if it helps the other guy to your detriment, particularly if this situation is zero sum, such as driving up your cost. And these thoughts are completely unorganized because this is not my area. But I think it's useful because if we all learn about things we don't know that much about to begin with, we get a whole lot smarter much more quickly. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Stowe, who's going to make us all smarter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me here this morning. Um, Dylan, thank you for the invitation to come speak this morning. I am not an attorney and I don't play one on TV and this is actually the first time I've ever been in the courtroom. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it's a little intimidating, but I appreciate the opportunity to come be part of this symposium today. Um, I was hired by the University of Kentucky about six and a half years ago to do economic research on the horse industry. And there aren't that many places in the country that need a position like that, but Kentucky is an obvious one. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And I, one, of, one of the reasons that Dylan invited me was to sort of set the stage, I think, as to the what the economic marketplace is for horse Kentucky. And then from there, that can help us understand better how regulations uh, may impact um, a, a certain industry and, and the people they're in. And so uh, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Let's see if it's on. Okay. When, uh, when I loaded my PowerPoint presentation, it said there were some problems and it would like to repair it. And it repaired it by taking out some of the great pictures I had. So I apologize. <laughs> this, uh, and it happened on the first slide. So the first picture that you don't see here is the um, one of the new branded logos for the state of Kentucky, Unbridled Spirit. You've seen it all. Kentucky with the running horse on it. Um, you've seen the blue horse. I mean, visit Lex. The horse is an integral part of the fabric of the state of Kentucky. Um, Lexington has dubbed itself the horse capital of the world, and certainly in the bluegrass area, it is home to a very concentrated part of the thoroughbred industry, for which Kentucky is probably best well known. Um, the we know that Kentucky is home to the Kentucky Derby, starting in 1875. Not quite the oldest horse race in America, but certainly by now the most famous, and also known across the world as the most exciting two minutes in sports. In addition to all of the thoroughbred activities in the state, um, Shelby County, just down the road, is known as the saddlebred capital of the world. Um, two breeds of horses actually originated in Kentucky. Does anyone know what they are? Saddlebred and mountain horse. Okay, we've got two breeds of horses that originated in Kentucky. Uh, many of you maybe were here when the 2010 World Equestrian Games were held at the Kentucky Horse Park, and this was um, this was really monumental because this was the first time that the World Equestrian Games had been held outside of Europe. This is sort of the the World Cup of soccer in the equine world. So this was a really big thing to come to Kentucky. Um, and, and sort of understanding how much horses are part of the fabric of Kentucky is really important to establishing and evaluating regulations. So what do we know about the horse industry in Kentucky? When I arrived here, it turns out that we knew very little. We had very little good data on what the horse industry looked like. There was a study that had been done in 1977 that's when Jimmy Carter was president and Seattle Slough won the Triple Crown. Uh, they gave us sort of our last comprehensive study of the equine industry. 
And so for many years, uh, my colleagues in the College of Ag and I worked together to get enough interest and support to conduct another broad scale survey. And this uh, ended up being the 2012 Kentucky Equine Survey. It had three components. Um, the first was to get an inventory of the equine operations in the state. An equine operation was an address that had at least one horse at it. Um, those could be your traditional horse farms that we would all think of. It also includes a place like um, the little property that we live on in Jessamine County. We're not a, a farm, uh, but we have a horse and a mule. Okay, so we're an equine operation. Might be a big uh, row crop farm, but they've got one or two horses on the property. Okay, so that it's a very broad definition. We wanted to get a number, an estimate of the number of operations and the number of horses in the state. We didn't know how many horses were in Kentucky. We don't know what they are. We don't know what they're used for. So that was the, the first purpose of the study. The second, and no less important, um, was to estimate the economic impact of the horse industry on the city of Utah. And the third that I'll talk a little bit more about later um, is to was con conducting a non-market valuation survey to estimate how important um, it is to have the horse farms here in this area. This was a big project. Um, it was a collaboration between the University of Kentucky and the Kentucky Horse Council. But even more broadly than that, it was a number of departments that were involved. It was a number of industry organizations that helped support and educate and get the word out. It was a $600,000 study. Uh, funding came from the University of Kentucky College of Ag, the Kentucky Ag Development Fund. This was significant because it was the first time since 2004 that the Kentucky Ag Development Fund had given money for the horse industry um, and private industry. Okay, so I will jump through all the uh, the methodology um, and get right to the results. So the 2012 Kentucky Equine Survey um, indicated that there were about 35,000 equine operations across the state, on which over 240,000 horses resided. There were 1.1 million acres of land specifically devoted to equine use. The value of equine, what I'm saying equine, I mean horses, ponies, mules, and donkeys, okay? Uh, and equine related assets, so farms, uh, fencing, buildings, those sorts of things, 23.4 billion. And this figure just swamps any other state that has done this sort of a study. It's almost double New York, which I believe was the next highest, uh, next highest state. So really, it's really deep and strong infrastructure in the state, uh, in the equine industry. Equine-related sales and income for 2011, about 1.1 billion. Equine-related expenditures, about 1.2 billion. Uh, so you look at that and see that expenditures are a little bit more than income, or, you know, it's indicating that there's an overall loss in the market. You understand that a lot of people in this industry are like me, that have a horse or two in the backyard, and all I do is pour money into them. <laughs> right? All of us who have horses know that. We don't we don't get that much out of them except the, the enjoyment. Um, and so I wouldn't wouldn't take this uh, as any sort of overall measure of profitability. We all like to buy matching saddle pads and polo wraps. <laughs> okay. Um, some of the most prevalent breeds, um, probably not a surprise to anyone in the room, but I was actually mildly surprised that thoroughbreds were number one. Um, I had heard when I moved here that actually quarter horses were more prevalent than thoroughbreds. Um, our study showed that that was not the case. Quarter horses were second, Tennessee walking horses third, um, saddle breds, mountain horses. The one that surprised me here was the donkeys and mules. 14,000 of them in the state. But if you drive around, a lot of the farms have had cattle and sheep. There's a donkey or two or five in the field. Do you know why they're out there? To protect them from coyotes. Like they, they hate dogs and they go after, you know, they protect the herd. So, uh, and, and we have a mule. He's a companion to my thoroughbred. And he loves dogs. Doesn't like my thoroughbred. <laughs> <laughs> We also wanted to know what these horses were used for. Okay, this helps us understand the different segments of the industry. The number one use of horses in the state is trail riding and pleasure. Okay, close behind, and one thing that sets Kentucky apart from other states, number two is broodmares. Okay, really intense breeding industry here in the state, both in thoroughbreds and in other breeds. 
the third most common use is nothing. Right? These are our idle or these are our pasture ornaments. Um, so you can go down the list and see the numbers, but what I want to point out is if you look at the brood mares, the foals, weaklings, and yearlings, those are our growing horses, and breeding stallions. Those number of horses almost equal the number of, of trail riding and pleasure horses um, in the state. So there's a big part of the industry devoted to the breeding of horses. So those are sort of the numbers of, of horses in the state. The second part of the study was looking at estimating the economic impact. So what is economic impact? We're, we're estimating the effect of economic activity related to the equine industry on Kentucky's economy. And there's a lot of different ways to measure economic impact. Um, the way that my colleagues measured it is, is the following. I'm gonna illustrate it using this, this simple example. So when you have a horse, you have to they have to see the vet. They always hurt themselves. That actually happened this week when my horse got out of the stall and had a little party in the barn um, while I was inside. So the vet has to come and I have to pay the vet money. Okay, that's a direct effect. In order to do his or her job, the vet has to purchase supplies. Those can include things like uh, syringes, vet wrap that matches the colors that you use in your barn, <laughs> latex gloves, uh, those are all captured in what we call indirect effects, which is sort of secondary. And then it also includes um, what we call induced effects. So the companies that sell the syringes and the fat wrap and the latex gloves have people that work there. They get paid because of the equine industry, and that's why they produce these products, and they go to the mall and they spend their money. Okay, uh, And so Economic impact, impact captures not only direct effects, but also parts of the indirect and induced effects. Those are captured through the, most, the use of a multiplier. And so very simply, the total economic impact is the direct effects, the total money spent, <coughs> multiplied by this multiplier, which we would assume is a number greater than one. Okay, so one dollar in sales in the equine industry leads to greater than $1 in sales in the state's economy. There are also different uh, ways that you can measure economic impact. There's three that we used in the study. The first is called the output effect. This is probably the most commonly used measure of economic impact. Uh, but think of this as revenue, new revenue generated because of the presence of the industry in the state. <clears throat> Jobs, number two, the employment effect. How many jobs are created because of the presence of the industry in the state? And the third is one that people don't hear much about, but it's probably a better measure of economic impact. It's called the value added effect. And you can think, think, think about this as profit. So not only are we accounting for revenue, but we're also accounting for costs. <clears throat> okay, so jumping to the bottom line, um, the total economic impact of the equine industry in Kentucky, the number that everyone reported from this study was out of effect, $2.99 million. Why is that the number that everyone reported? Because it was the biggest, okay? Um, so you can see that broken down into some different sectors, breeding, competition, racing, recreation, and then other things that we couldn't really categorize. And you see that among this output effect, racing um, has the biggest economic impact uh, followed by breeding and competition uh, sectors of the industry, which are both close. When we look at the value added effect, the total economic impact is about 1.4 million. We expect that to be less, right, because we're taking into account the costs. Um, and again, racing leads the way there um, with breeding and competition close behind. The third way we, uh, I mentioned that we measure economic impact is by jobs created. Okay, and look at the breeding industry. You said there were a lot of horses in the state involved in the breeding sector of the industry, and it's the leading sector in terms of estimated employment and with a total of almost 41,000 jobs created um, because of the presence of the equine industry. We also measured tax impact. The tax contribution was approximately $134 million from 2011 
that is based largely on state income tax, but also on sales tax. Um, I'm not sure our, our state has never decided whether horses are, agri are, are livestock or not. And so they treat them as agriculture and livestock when they're, when they're reporting ag statistics, but then they tax them like they are not um, livestock. And so the equine industry has to pay sales tax on fencing, feed, those sorts of things that all the other uh, types of livestock don't have to. Okay, the last part of the study that I want to mention, and then I'm happy to take any questions, we wanted to conduct what's called a non-market valuation study. And basically what we wanted to do is see if there's a way that we can estimate a value for estimate the value of the presence of the equine industry in the state of Kentucky. I love driving to work, driving by all the horse farms every day. That is something that I value. Um, I don't necessarily have to pay for it, right? I don't have to, it's not transacted on the market, but it's still worth something to me. These non matched market valuation studies sort of get at trying to place a dollar figure on something that's not traded on the market. So we all know that ag land is constantly under development pressure. Um, development generates tax revenues, it generates more money, um, and as populations continue to grow, there's more um, pressure to provide more services and to have more places for these people to live. But in addition to the, um, the potential of tax revenue generation, there are a number of what economists call positive externalities of keeping ag land as ag land and not developing it. They can be environmental, green space, uh, recreational, having places to go hike, bike, trail ride, and simply aesthetic. As I mentioned, it's just been beautiful to drive around uh, this area. And so the question that we were asking in the study is, are residents, the average resident, don't care if they're involved in the equine industry or not, are they willing to pay a little bit extra in taxes to preserve the land? Because by preserving it, you're foregoing tax revenues that otherwise would have been generated. If they are willing to pay, how much? So I'm going to skip um, all of the methodology in the study, but we sent the survey to 8,200 residents in the state of Kentucky. It's a lot of envelopes to stop and lick and stamp. Um, about 6,000 of them were, 6,200 were in the bluegrass area, and then the remaining 2,000 were sent all across the state. They were randomly selected individuals uh, that may or may not have been involved in the equine industry. And we basically asked them two questions. The first is, would you support a free program to preserve horse land um, you know, if you didn't have to pay for it? So we were sort of trying to get a general feeling of their, how they felt towards the equine industry, from positive towards a neutral, negative. Um, and then, for those who are willing to pay, for, who are willing to support the free program, would they be willing to pay a little bit extra every year um, in order to preserve horse, uh, horse land? And so, our results show that more than 85% of the respondents supported the free preservation program. That basically, to us, just indicated a general positive perception towards the presence of the industry in the state. But of those that supported the free program, over 80% were willing to pay something um, to help preserve the equine lands in the state, and about 60% were willing to pay at least $50 a year um, in order to do that. Some were willing to pay much more. Um, and, and so we found these results very useful in understanding how much residents in the state of Kentucky value the, um, the presence of the horse industry in the state. And these results help whether it was someone in far western or far eastern uh, Kentucky or in central Kentucky. Um, the, the caveats that normally go with this, we are uh, asking residents to pay with hypothetical money, and I'm always more willing to spend hypothetical money than real money. Um, and there's always a potential for, for sample bias. Okay, so, so to close my segment, um, the reason why I think it's useful to think about the equine industry in the different sectors that we mentioned and among the different breeds and among the different uses is that the effect of regulations um, might depend on which part of the industry you're targeting. 
And as I started breaking down our industry into these different sectors, um, I was going to list, you know, some issues that might be more relevant to one than the other. But then I started to <coughs> realize that there was a lot of crossover, and so I just sort of grouped a bunch of current issues that um, probably there's there, there's a lot of work being done on these issues currently, um, and how they affect the different sectors. So labor regulations, health safety, governance, medication, import, export, quarantine, animal welfare, travel, access to land, sales tax, integrity, tourism, development, insurance. There's so much going on that, that really affect these sectors individually and as a whole. And so those are things to keep in mind moving forward as we hear um, from some of the other speakers about regulations and the impact of both the local and uh, state level. And I had a really cute picture of a pole scratching his head. <laughs> I just have to imagine it. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah. Is there such a sense of relative size of the wine industry compared with other large industries? I don't have a sense of what the scale is with a number like 20 billion or 5 billion in equity compared to the Right. Um, so, you know, one of the things when we did the study, Oh, I'll repeat the question. The question was, can I get some sort of sense of the scale of the size of the equine industry in the state relative to others? Uh, because it's hard to put those numbers into context. context. Um, it's hard to compare economic impact studies because the methodology that is used um, can vary widely. But what I can tell you is that my colleague that did the economic impact study for the Kentucky Equine Survey also did a study of the corn industry, um, the wood and forest industry. I think those were the two that she did. The wood and forest was close to, I think, a $10 billion impact. But surprisingly, um, equine was larger than both corn and soybeans. Um, in terms of the output effect and, and even more so the value added. So there's more profitability in the equine industry than there would be equine in the farm. Um, I also looked for something on the coal industry, and the most recent study I could find was from O2, and it was quite small um, relative to the equine industry, which surprised me. I don't know how much weight to put on that, uh, but that's, those are the only things. There was a lot made of a headline that the chicken industry is bigger than the equine industry. Yeah. Chickens. <laughs> Less chicken. Yeah. Um, is that accurate? That, yeah, that, that's accurate. And especially in terms of the, the revenue, the output effect. But I think that the equine industry is much closer to the poultry, poultry industry um, in terms of the value add effect and so in terms of the profitability. The, the poultry industry is so vertically integrated um, that uh, we're not sure what number they're measuring. Um, so, good question. Other questions? Can, yeah. can you go back to the slide and add on? I think the number was 23 to 24. Yes. That was the valuation. I'm actually going to go to a different one. Okay. My supplementary materials. Okay. I guess my, my question was uh, is there a chance that there's uh, commerce out there in the equine industry that couldn't be captured because it was a private sale, for example, of a horse as opposed to being auctioned and keeping it based on the And also, is there a chance that? Uh, and maybe a multiplier and catching. But is there a chance that there's also uh, commerce done by accountants, lawyers, insurance agents, and things like that that really doesn't get captured because it's, it's not readily identifiable? Right. Um, to some extent, let me answer your second question first. To some extent, I think that's captured through the use of the multiplier effect. Um, those types of businesses were not surveyed directly. So when we were asking these different operations for their expenses and how much they spent on insurance and so on, we could, we could yeah. back, back that out. Um, 
Um, your first question, um, certainly the results of the study depend on the data that are provided by the survey respondents. Um, there were 15,000 surveys available across the state, uh, and this was done by the National Ag Statistics Service, and they did a weighted sampling where they knew who the large farms were, and they sampled 100% of the large farms. And as you got down to a smaller operation size, um, they did more of a probabilistic sampling. Um, there, we did have some trouble getting uh, farms to respond, so you provided your best estimates. Yeah. We actually have several people watching online, and we have a user who uh, would like to ask a question regarding tourism yes. and whether or not there have been any studies done to uh, see the impact of the equine industry on the tourism industry in Kentucky. Great. I think that's a great question, and I don't know that there has been a comprehensive study that has done that. I believe the Department of Tourism did a economic impact study following the World Equestrian Games to try to capture the effect of um, the the individuals who attended the World Equestrian Games and their that impact on the area. Um, but that is not something, to my knowledge, that has been done yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I realize that this is the first study since 1977. Do you have any sense of how much the quantity should be by the decline in economic value of the Um. No. <laughs> you know, without um, with, without data, there's no way that we can capture those sorts of changes. And, and that was one of the real um, issues that finally got this project underway, was when the recession hit and the farms started having trouble, they went to the state government. And all they could give were anecdotes. There was no data. So the goal with something like this is to hopefully be able to do it every 10 years. It would be nice to be able to do it more often, but I think we're going to have a hard time raising the funds to do it like every five years. Dylan, just to comment on that, Bob might be able to um, step in on this as well, but the only informa real information we have um, about the economics of the decline from 2008 early to 2011, the downturn in the major November breeding stock sales. So those numbers were down 40 to 60 percent gross sales over the sort of three year period in particular. So that's the best, probably the most economic impact in the state in the recession was on the thoroughbred industry because they're such a big revenue generator. Whereas I think with the pleasure horses, et cetera, I'm sure you thought there was a downturn. Number of people that have them, expenses of you know, buying hay and those sorts of things, but those are that's really the only sort of clear cut figure we have on that. I think I agree with Laura, and the, the thing that's interesting about the equine industry is there's so many different facets of it.
I knew of L was, and thankfully it wasn't as discriminating. So uh, I'm a proud U of L graduate, and I'm, I'm just honored to be here at the uh, University of Kentucky Law School, speaking in any capacity. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, equine law, regulatory law. It's a subject of uh, some interest to me. I practice in that area somewhat. I, I practice somewhat in a lot of different areas, uh, general practitioner of sorts. And so uh, I taught this subject at the University of Louisville for a number of years and, and still do whenever they would like to do it. But I've uh, written a book on it, etc. cetera. Uh, in keeping with the topic, I want to talk about how important uh, regulations are and the huge impact of, of how these are written impacts litigation and the results of that litigation obviously it depends on a word really uh, there's case law of how one word determines the outcome of a challenge to a specific regulation but before I start talking about a specific case I want to give you a little history I'm a, I'm a old history major from undergrad days, so a lot of, I've got a lot of history in my book, and it's interesting to find out how we got to, to where there's even this subject matter. Uh, we fought, as most of you know, I believe, a, uh, a war with Great Britain in the 1770s and 80s to uh, obtain our freedom, and uh, in a little bit of a contradiction, we won that war, but then we adopted Pretty much our hated mother country's legal system. Um, it turned out it was pretty good, jury system and all. So we also adopted uh, later, much later, uh, their regulatory scheme as it applied to horse racing. Horse racing has been around basically and competitively since ancient Greece, uh, but in roughly the 1600s under the reign of King Charles II. Uh, the public got interested in these contests. Uh, betting started to occur. They, they needed some rules. So the king came up with some rules. Obviously, that's what kings do. And they had a provision. They were in writing, and they had, uh, there was a way even to, uh, to challenge the outcome of a race. And you, you submitted something in writing to these judges that were appointed. Uh, who ostensibly knew something about the game uh, and agreed to what an effective binding arbitration that you would be bound by the decision. And obviously, at that point, government was not involved. Uh, these were private affairs, but uh, as the game, the sport progressed, there were racetracks built in England. Uh, again, the public was invited in, money changed hands. Uh, there was all kind of opportunity for dishonesty and uh, fraud and corruption. Uh, we have that in our, our sport. It's some of the more colorful elements of our history, unfortunately. And so there was an attempt in England in uh, roughly the mid 1800s to clean up the game to, uh, to get the kick the cheaters out and that kind of thing. And so uh, there was a the jockey club that was founded in England, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. And their rule was law. This, again, this was a private organization, but they uh, they came up with the rules, they enforced the rules, and there was no appeal to court, there was no judicial review or any concept of it uh, at that time. Uh, the interesting thing, the first regulatory case of any kind was in Great Britain in 1845. You may have even read about it in the torts class. Can I get these law students we have here? Mostly. Victims. Anyway, uh, Wood versus Ledbetter, which is a case uh, where an individual was forcibly ejected from a racetrack, Doncaster, which is still existence, um, who had been ruled off by the jockey club because he was a bookmaker. That's how you made bets back then. Who had committed the unpardonable sin? That what? What's the only offense really a bookmaker can make? And that is he didn't pay. He didn't pay, so he was persona non grata at all the racetracks in England. He nevertheless paid his way into Doncaster and was spotted and was ejected by what the security at that time was. Uh, 
uh, Ledbetter was the, a sheriff that had been hired by the racetrack to work part time as security. Wood was the, uh, the the bookmaker, and Wood claimed that he had a, a uh, contract, if you will, an implied contract, because he had purchased a ticket, a commission ticket, and it's the uh, court in England. Ultimately, the appeals court said that it wasn't a contract; it was a revocable license, which is still printed. If you look at any ticket to any sporting event or concert, you'll see uh, uh, some rock star. They're printed on all the tickets on the back. You know, this is a revocable license. We can, despite you buying it, we can kick you out and violate certain rules and conditions. And that all comes from Wood versus Ledbetter, which uh, again didn't have anything to do with the regulation per se. This was a, an action between an individual and a racetrack, but it was the beginning of people going to court to get their grievances addressed in some fashion. We transition over to the United States, horse racing uh, in Kentucky, certainly in Maryland, uh, other states that. Uh, uh, wasn't really regulated. The Civil War intervened, but after the Civil War, there was a growth in uh, horse racing and interest in it. That by the 1890s, as Edward L. Bowen has written, there were like three or four hundred racetracks, uh, totally unregulated. You know, if you threw up a dirt track somewhere and had a few horses, you had a quote racetrack, and uh, a lot of skullduggery went on. A lot of a lot of dishonesty. Public got involved, the press got involved, and demanded that racing either clean up its act or, or put it out of business altogether. And some legislatures did that, uh, that just passed laws to prohibit any kind of racing or gambling. And uh, racing never made it back into those states. Uh, in New York, which was the Contrary to what our previous speaker said, at least at that time, New York was the epicenter of, of thoroughbred racing, breeding. Uh, they'll tell you today they still are. Uh, depends on the subject to debate. But uh, uh, in New York, the people that enjoyed the sport were habits of industry and wealthy people. Uh, there were obviously patrons that enjoyed it as well, but there was. Uh, they knew they had to do something, so they, they formed their own jockey club, again, copying right after England, uh, our own jockey club in the 1890s, and they came up with what was called a board of control, and uh, nice thing. Uh, that's what they attempted to do, try to clean up the game. Uh, they licensed people, uh, riders, racing officials, uh, that kind of thing, and it was a complete failure. Okay, it was uh, ignored. They had no enforcement mechanism. They had no a way to really have hearings. They had all this power, but but it, there was no way to really exercise it. And again, it looked like the game was going to go out of existence. When Inter, stage right, August Belmont, uh, Jr., although he dropped the Jr. After, the day after his father's funeral, who uh, was also a pretty prominent man, uh, the banking industry, which means they had a lot of money. And August Belmont Jr. enjoyed uh, what his father had started, which was a huge breeding uh, in, uh, farm and uh, business in New York, and uh, raced a lot of their horses, and they had a lot of success. And Belmont didn't want to see this. He did love the game, and for the good of the game, he decided basically by himself it was not going to fail. Uh, it's not going to be legislated out of the system. So uh, he knew that a private organization could do it. So he went to the New York legislature and they got a bill passed uh, called the Percy Gray Act. And I profile a couple of these legislators in my book. I, I'm, as a former legislator, I'm partial to legislative good ones. And uh, these two young people, they won, uh, uh, Percy was 32 years old, 32 year old lawyer. Uh, Mr. Gray was a 34-year-old farmer from Poughkeepsie, and they got together. Uh, uh, Gray had trotting horses, and they they got a bill through. Just as difficult in the 1890s as it probably is today 
they got a bill through all the way through the New York legislature uh, that created a racing commission. That was the first concept of a, of a quasi legislative judicial executive function, an, an administrative agency, kind of unheard of at the time, but that they would police the sport. And they would be they would be able to issue even subpoenas to have hearings and, and uh, license people and revoke licenses, license racetracks. There, there was the proliferation of racetracks in New York, and uh, they would decide whether or not a license would be issued. And if you didn't have a license, like the law is today, uh, I mean, can I go out? Can you go out? You and I decide with who are our resources we want to go out? And we want to have a racetrack. In uh, Bacon County, Chesapeake County. Uh, why should just Churchill Downs and Keeneland and Ellis Park, why should they just go on? We, we think we can make a go of it in our county. Well, you can't. You have to get a license. If you don't get that license to have that enterprise, the state can shut you down as a nuisance. So this all started in 1895 with the creation of the first racing commission in New York. Kentucky was the second state that adopted a racing commission. And that's where regulatory law really got its birth. Uh, those two states, uh, of course, had to survive a baptism of fire. Somebody challenged immediately, almost, the constitutionality of this delegation of legislative power to an administrative agency. And luckily for our game, the sport, uh, courts in New York and Kentucky upheld this delegation of power is something that uh, was part of a new concept called police powers. I'm sure you've studied about that in the constitutional law. Uh, something that uh, the court said was, was even in, in those days, uh, a, a very limited government. They said this was something the government could do in the area of health and morals. It, it was called uh, legislation to delegate this authority to quasi-public agencies. They had expertise in this area and they could adopt probably regulations and they could affect run the sport this got it out of the legislative uh, most legislators were, like i was lazy you know they, they didn't have to run a racing industry or water quality or something else they delegated it to these these agencies uh, they also created of course the right of judicial review and that's the key concept involved in, in regulatory law is that once the agency has ruled its issue of final decision, there is an opportunity for an agreed party to to uh, to challenge that and to have a, a court look at it, not all over again, but review the record at least to see if the law was followed and to see if, if there were any other possible mistakes that were made in, in carrying out the job. And of course, most agency decisions are upheld because if the decisions are based on substantial evidence and compliance with the law that they, the legislature gave them, courts are going to defer to that expertise and not uphold what they do. There's obviously lots of exceptions to that, which is why there's a pretty thriving practice in this area. Uh, courts like to make lots of exceptions. So, uh, that was the uh, key concept. In fact, even in 1968, in the famous Kentucky Derby case involving Dancer's Image, uh, the Court of Appeals, among other things, in addition to restoring the commission decision that disqualified the, uh, the winner of that year, Dancer's Image, they also held that the Racing Commission itself could be an agreed party. There was a challenge that, that, that they had no standing. Do that, and so the court said they even had standing to appeal a lower court decision that had vacated the decision they made. So uh, I want to touch on one area of, of the history as it pertains to the drug cases that I had talked so far about the power of, of uh, racing commissions. Uh, another aspect of uh, regulatory law is very important is. Uh, the enforcement of those decisions of the Racing Commission and how the courts handled this up through uh, 
I'm going to say roughly the 1940s to current times. Um, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, states began to adopt, uh, or the commissions did, what's called an absolute insurer rule. Okay, if you're the enlisted trainer of ours, and that horse is tested after it wins the race, found to have a positive drug test or a prohibited uh, drug or medication, uh, you're automatically uh, suspended or punished in some way, disciplined in some way, because you're the one that's held responsible for the condition of the horse if you're a listed trainer. Uh, that isn't given a second thought today, partly, unless there's some avenue of appeal that's very, very unique. But in, when this concept was first uh, enunciated and challenged, uh, courts had a huge problem with it. Uh, the very first case in Maryland uh, in the mid 40s uh, struck down the absolute sure rule. They said that we can't believe that somebody can't even put on evidence. They can't, uh, they're, they're guilty until proven innocent. It's uh, a judge in a California case called it un American. A lot of emotion was involved. If you, if you read some of these uh, decisions, uh, it could be quite emotional. Um, in the Maryland case, the, the Court of Appeals in Maryland, the highest court, in, in throwing out unanimously their absolute sure rule, uh, it said that uh, the fellow that was challenging the, the uh, standard of the buyers. Uh, is a clean, straight, decent jockey and trainer, which he has enjoyed a reputation for years, which was attested to by many witnesses of high standing, uh, is not to be considered a determining guilt or innocence. In fact, the commission attested to his fine record, as will appear from the remarks made by its chairman. All of this, like so much chat, is to be blown away as waste in the operation of the machinery set up under this rule. The irrebuttable presumption destroyed the right of buyers to offer evidence to establish his innocence. If this is just, then the term <coughs> unjust is without meaning. Well, I've used that a few times in other, <laughs> other areas. Um, I've really worked up about a case. Um, having no explicit rule on the matter, the commission seeks to apply a rule of this case out of thin air. It is worse than applying a regularly adopted rule ex post facto. It is condemning a trainer for his failure to do something. This is because they said he didn't guard his horse, which there was no regulation about that. Punishing him for something he failed to do when he had no way in the world to know what it was required of him by the commission to do. Uh, you know, pretty strong. Uh, and then, so Maryland struck it down. Uh, Florida, in a very unusual set of circumstances, not what we went to, they, in a similar case, right after that, they struck down their absolute sure rule. I mean, if the sport didn't have something equivalent to this, it may have gone out of existence because the public was not being protected. And people, uh, if the racing commission had to prove with witnesses or film or something that a person actually drugged his horse, uh, it was going to be an impossible standard, almost as impossible as what they were enforcing on the, the licensee. So ultimately, California, in a case, Sandstrom versus California Horse Racing Board, upheld for the first time the uh, absolute insurer rule in the late 40s in, in a 5 to 2 decision. And other states started following, other racing states uh, acknowledging that though it was harsh, though at times it was unfair. That the sport was not going to survive unless there was a way to protect the integrity of the game. And, and hard as this was, this was the only way we could figure out. They could figure out. Anyway, that's a little bit of the history that at least I find fascinating. You get up to, to current times, and in keeping with the topic, um, what are some recent trends? Uh, I don't know. It, was this in the book for the you know, other I think it's my outline of book. Okay. I've kind of broken down about three or four different areas. Uh, I've got drug cases, trainer responsibility rules. I, I put it here, hence there is no trend. Uh, pretty much states are, state courts are, are dismissing almost as a matter of routine, particularly in New York, I mean, they're like three and four paragraphs, any challenge to their 
drug enforcement cases. Uh, as, again, as long as they follow the book, they're, they're based on substantial evidence. Uh, the recent case of, uh, of uh, Dick Dutro, uh, the Alamo Golf, in here to keep up with the sport, this is a trainer that uh, seemed bent on, on racking up uh, record numbers of violations in any state he raised in. In fact, <laughs> Because I write in my in my book, I make a I use as an example, uh, just so you know, you can see here's a revised. So just I'm showing you the early part of the book what a notice of a hearing looks like, and it didn't really dawn on me. I just really picked it at random until Dutro started getting more and more of the news. It's a case involving one of his horses. Okay, that was uh, there's so many of them. Anyway. Naira finally had enough in New York tribe. They gave him a 10 year suspension. And he challenged that and said, among other things, that it was too harsh, too punitive, et cetera. And the court in New York, the court, uh, their, their mid level court, appellate court, had no problem upholding that. Uh, they said it's, it's uh, under the circumstances, it's reasonable. Uh, what happened, what he was accused of doing was approved or was proven with substantial evidence. And so, too bad. <laughs> so, uh, as states get more and more into adopting the uniform medication rules, uniform enforcement of those rules, I think you're going to see uh, even more consistency in the courts of uh, uh, not really allow, unless they're, again, they're very unique circumstances, to, uh, to challenge them, uh, those decisions that. Uh, Bribe people with their license and suspend them or fine them, whatever. There was a recent case that just came out, Ford versus New York State Race and Wage Report by New York's highest court, the Court of Appeals, that upheld New York's scheme for out of competition testing, something Kentucky, Kentucky also has. It's not the challenge, in my knowledge, but it was challenged in New York where, where regulators can go to farms or wherever the horses are and test them there if they're, uh, whether or not the people there. That own the farm have a license or not. Uh, that was upheld unanimously by the New York Court of Appeals as a reasonable uh, regulation to ensure the integrity of the sport. So, not much uh, dichotomy there, not much uh, uh, challenge in that area that we can take note of. I, I mentioned reciprocity. Uh, again, it's a pretty standard thing in our sport that. Uh, Rulings and decisions by one racing commission are usually followed by other racing commissions, other racing authorities. But there is an interesting case. Again, very, you have to be very careful about draftsmanship, the, the regulations that you adopt, where you talk about reciprocity. Because uh, there's a case out of New Jersey that, that came out late last year, a lot of versus the New Jersey Racing Commission. Although this is one of the Things I don't know. Not to be published. I love that. Not to be published. Um, so, nevertheless, I'm going to talk about it. I guess that's okay. But it's an interesting case because it's, it involves reciprocity between a ruling of a different country, not a different state, a different country, in Canada, where up in Canada, and this is a trotting horse, uh, had a positive drug test. They announced the positive drug test. So, and the 90 day suspension on the same day of the horse. It couldn't run anywhere for 90 days. They took the horse back to New Jersey where they were from and tried to uh, run it at the Meadowlands. The Meadowlands said, No, we're going to follow what the, uh, it was within that 90 days. They said, No, we're going to follow the, uh, uh, what the Ontario Racing Commission, the Racing Authority did. Even though uh, you've, you've challenged that, uh, we're going to follow it. And uh, I'm leaving out a whole lot of the interest of time, but ultimately a New Jersey appellate court said the commission was wrong to do that because the legal standard in Canada was not the standard that we follow in America, which under Perry versus Parts in the U.S. Supreme Court case, the only, really the only equine regulatory case decided in modern times by our U.S. Supreme Court said there has to be a meaningful, after a, a uh, positive after, after you announce an intent to suspend or discipline the licensing 
we're entitled to a prompt post suspension hearing, as the court said, in a meaningful way and a meaningful time. You just can't keep a guy out here dangling while he, after he's appealed something. So they had no provision for that up in Canada, and the New Jersey appellate court ended up saying, you know, the, our, their commission was wrong uh, not to apply the same standard that we have here in America to that case. Uh, when the Canadian authorities did not do that. So, again, tailor, you must tailor your regulations, I guess, according to these, uh, this case law, be very careful in doing it. Uh, I've got to enter the claiming rules are under current, uh, I'm sure Bob knows about this case, uh, Jim Gotchian versus Kentucky Horse Racing Commission is now in our Supreme Court in the briefing stage. A fellow challenged so far unsuccessfully our claiming rules and how they are drafted, how they're implemented and enforced, and so far as uh, whether or not he can uh, take a horse within a certain amount of time that he claims uh, from a race at a track in Kentucky, take it to another state uh, and race within that time period. Uh, that our regulations prohibit that. They have to stay here within a certain amount of time 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is. I think it's 30. And uh, uh, he challenged that as a restraint on interstate commerce, among other things. And uh, the, the trial court in, in, uh, in uh, Frankfurt had no problem upholding the regulation. The Court of Appeals upheld it. Uh, so I'm kind of surprised the Supreme Court. Uh, there's lots of my good cases our Supreme Court declined to take, uh, but they took this one. And that's okay in case they're in here somewhere listening. <laughs> Uh, do whatever they want. Uh, they agreed to take this at the end of 2014. I just want to tell you the case number is 2014 SC 0000108. That's the 108 case they've taken the whole year. Really busy up there at the Supreme Court. Anyway, they took that one. I hope you're paused. So it's going to be interesting to see what this is. You know, somebody, three people at least, had an issue with this, you could imply, because it takes that many to, to take a case and, and grant the petition for uh, discretionary review. So I'm watching the case very closely. That is uh, not no rooting interest, but I can petition again. See how that turns out. The case, the, the area of the law where there's a lot of ferment, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, is in the area of objections. Um, these are cases particularly of licensing. There, there's no real case law anymore. I, I, I wrote a book, and, and, and the minute it came out, it was one chapter was obsolete. I have a whole chapter on objections. <laughs> yes, thank you, Bob. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I don't have that on the website, by the way. But the uh, I wrote a chapter on the ejection of undesirable you know, patrons. Well, you know, we, we, we have trouble getting people to come to the track now, so we don't really eject any patrons. And they don't have to come to the track to bet anymore. Okay, they could do it sitting in their living room, in their car, on their phone, whatever, with uh, uh, advanced deposit wagering accounts. So uh, I'm not talking about people per se, patron, but certainly in light with if you have a license, uh, case law has held for decades that, particularly even in the Supreme Court, Barry versus Barchett case, that your license as a trainer jockey, a bloodstock agent, whatever. Everybody that works on the track has to have a license. Uh, is a property right and cannot be deprived without due process of law. So uh, these, and it used to be in the 50s, I guess if you own a racetrack or sit on a racing commission, you call it the good old days of the 50s when, when pretty much a track didn't want you there whether you had a license or not, uh, they could kick you out with impunity. Okay, the, the famous case of Bobby Martin, very famous jockey, back in the 50s, had a checkered, as they like to say, a checkered uh, background. Uh, he bet on, his, on some other horse other than when he was riding one time. They only gave him 10 years for that Maryland, of which he had to do like six before somebody by the name of Alfred. Vanderbilt, who had some modest amount of influence in the racing industry, <laughs> got his license restored. 
But anyways, during a time he had a license restored, even in New Jersey, he had a New Jersey license. He shows up at Mom and Park to ride, and Avery Haskell, who, when you watch the Haskell, they grade one race for three year olds there. That's the guy. Uh, threw him out, said, so We don't want you here. Why? Because of his record. Okay? And a federal court and a federal appeals court upheld that, said tracks have an inherent right to do that. That has all changed, and fairly recent, in my opinion, the uh, in, in 2011, there was a case came down out of West Virginia from their state court, uh, the Supreme Court of Appeals, they have no intermediate appellate court in West Virginia. So they kind of combine, I like the name, the Supreme Court of Appeals, it's like our Court of Appeals and our Supreme Court. Okay? Supreme Court of Appeals held that in a case involving a jockey who among other things, he was in a group of jockeys that was not weighing in, correct? They caught this on film. The clerk of the scales was kind of going along with it, not sure if it was for any money, but uh, the jockeys were not were violating the rule about weighing in after a race. They weren't really being weighed in at all. They just kind of waving them all through. And um, they caught this, so they, they, they uh, the stewards fined and suspended the jockey. They fired the court of the scales. He, he never appealed anything. He moved on. But the jockeys challenged that. They filed an appeal with the racing commission. While that was going on, the tracks threw them out and said, we're not a party to this appeal in front of the racing commission. Uh, the, the, the jockeys went to court to try to get a stay while the, their appeal was pending in front of the racing commission. The court gave them that stay. The track said, we don't have to acknowledge that. We have a right to do what we want to protect the integrity of the game. So, jockeys amended their, their complaint to include the tracks, brought them into court, and the court issued an injunction to them and said, you got to let these guys back in because they have a right under West Virginia law to appeal the uh, suspension and the fine. And you have to let them in while that's going on. They appealed that to the uh, West Virginia Court of Supreme Court of Appeals, and that court, in a three to two decision, said sided with the racing commission and the, and the jockey. Very unusual situation. I'm, I'm watching the oral argument on TV or on my computer in my office, and I see the lawyer for the racing commission get up in the oral argument and side with the jockeys they were on their side i guess a turf battle i know it is because i ended up talking to the lawyer the commission they didn't want to cede this authority to the tracks there's a lot of politics that goes on with any pngi track but that's another story but anyway they were having an internal battle <coughs> over whose authority it was to revoke a license or not and the, the uh, racing commission side with the jockeys instead of, you would have thought, maybe with the track in policing the, the integrity of the game. Uh, the lawyer for the West Virginia Racing Commission doesn't like it when I put it that way. But anyway, that's the way I see it. So the court said three to two decision, very bitter dissent, again, a uh, very closely contested issue, but that they have this right. The tracks don't have an unfettered right to throw people out. Although the high court didn't even talk about some of the cases I've ever talked about, they, they, they just said under uh, West Virginia law, they got that right. As a sequel to that, uh, the West Virginia Commission adopted regulations on how this would work. They, the tracks, if they want to eject somebody, they have to go to the commission and by a preponderance of the evidence prove that it's, it's they, they should have the right to do that. And the tracks, Challenged that, and just in a decision a couple of months ago, lost that on appeal. The circuit court and the higher court said the, the, the uh, uh, commission was within its plenary powers to adopt that kind of regulation. They didn't have to go through and get a bill passed. That's what the argument was. They got to do this through the legislature, where I guess they thought they might have had a better shot uh, because they have friends there. So anyway, interesting case, not, so not to just contain it to West Virginia, which by the way, if you want an equine regulatory law practice, 
and, and works a little slim where you are. Go to West Virginia. These people litigate. There's there's about three or four major cases ready to come down from the West Virginia Supreme Court on ejections. If somebody filed a frontal assault, constitutional assault uh, challenge to their their uh, absolute sure rule. Uh, there's three or a couple of other on, on suspensions. This jockey case is back up before them uh, about people that didn't weigh in properly. And so you need to go to practice in there to go to West Virginia. The, uh, not to keep it contained for state courts, and I'll finish. Uh, there's a case in federal court in Pennsylvania, Marino, where a, a, a federal court struck down not just a regulation, a statute in Pennsylvania because it didn't, again, didn't offer someone uh, a prompt, in their opinion, a prompt uh, hearing after they had been ejected, although there was an issue about whether or not Mr. Brino was even ejected. This is another PNGI case, Penn National in this case, and they, <coughs> I guess to get around Reynolds, West Virginia, where they didn't do so hot, they they didn't eject this guy. They just said, you can't enter any horses. You can't transfer any horses. Anything you've already entered is going to be scratched. Uh, and, and before you go anywhere, you got to tell us what you're doing, et cetera. And it, it, the, the federal court said that's a constructive ejection. Okay. They tried to get around the racing commission. Kind of, they said, well, you weren't, when he asked for a hearing to challenge that, he said, they said, well, that, that's not a debt. You haven't been thrown out. So, we're not, we're not talking about hearing. Federal court said differently. Uh, again, license the property right. If you can't use it, it's not worth anything. You have a right to appeal this. Uh, and, and not only that, but in Pennsylvania, uh, it said they had to schedule. And again, it comes down to one word. Court said the law in Pennsylvania said they have to schedule a hearing within so many days after the appeal. But there was nothing after that. Like, Okay, after, how long have they got to schedule? Never got to that point. And a federal judge said, Judge Rambo, by the way, I said, um, woman, uh, said, uh, no, that's constitutionally infirm. So, and it wasn't even appealed. So that's the law in Pennsylvania. So again, very important uh, how these uh, uh, regulations are drafted. I don't know about improving or impeding, but you can improve them or improve your chances for uh, them uh, surviving a court case, court challenge, if they're drawn as carefully as possible, keeping in mind some of these, can, some of the keeping ahead of these new trends, uh, and the, as some of these other states are doing, particularly as involved licensees. Uh, courts are beginning, they're finding state action more than they ever did, and that, that'd be a whole other topic for another day. State action used to be racetracks were private actors, not anymore. Some of these states are coming out and saying, you know, the racing secretary has a license. The security people from the racing commission, they're public employees. Uh, all, they find all these connections that are state action. And what's that do? That allows you to file a civil rights claim in federal court. In <coughs> so very important concepts. I'm probably taking way too long, but I've been waiting. 42 years, what is it, point over here to UK and, and uh, appear somewhere. And show them I did get a law degree. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Oh, any questions, I guess? Is that part of what I'm supposed to do? Or actually, just, Bob, do you want to do Sorry. more regulatory, then we do oh, all yeah. regulatory questions. Okay. okay, sounds like a plan. I was having a good day until I found out West Virginia has four significant cases in front of the Supreme Court. It may affect what uh, happens in Kentucky. It kind of ruined my morning at least. Sorry. Uh, very good job, Bob. And I, don't, I wasn't here for the first part, so if you didn't recommend that you look at your book, you, you really should read Bob's book. We have a copy of the library. And they use, use it all. Okay, uh, my topic is regulation of horse racing in Kentucky from a regulator's point of view. Before I get into it, I have to issue a disclaimer. 
the uh, positions that I express in my presentation are those uh, are mine only. They are not of the Racing Commission. And I think there's a state law that requires me to say that before I go on and say anything else. Also, this discussion is not to be published. <laughs> you know, I agree with you. I don't like that, but in this case, I feel like it's appropriate. Um, I'm going to discuss that topic in probably 20, 25 minutes, something like that, and also try to uh, discuss somewhat the issues of do these regulations improve or impede. Um, it, I think it's all, always good when making a presentation to kind of understand the audience. Uh, so I have a couple of questions that I'm going to ask. And it's, this is in the nature of a pop quiz because I've never had the opportunity to do that before. Uh, but Connor and Dylan are not allowed to answer because I told them the question <laughs> last time. And, and I have to admit I gave them some of the answers. So they, they were not three for three. Okay, so if you can answer this question, please raise your hand. First question, who won the 2014 Kentucky Derby? Oh, come on. This is our signature industry, and Laura doesn't count, because <laughs> she's on the panel. Okay, hold your hands up again. Okay. What's the answer? California Chrome. That's right, that's right. Okay, so far we've got one or two A's and a bunch of S's. <laughs> okay. Sounds like the law school. Yeah, it's got at least first semester. <laughs> okay, next question, a little harder. Who won the 2014 Kentucky Oaks? Mm, okay. Untappable. Untappable. Uh, I made, made an exception for you Thank because you. nobody else was answering. <laughs> Okay, I tap them. Uh, and I, I forgot to tell you, if you answer these questions correctly, at the end of my presentation, I'll give you my betting recommendations for the Derby this year. <laughs> and you will not have to declare any income on your income taxes because there's nothing of value in my recommendations, that's for sure. Okay, who are the 2015 winter book co-favorites for the Kentucky Derby? You really have to like this stuff to know that. <laughs> Texas Red and American Pharaoh. So, uh, since I play the chalk all the time, you may, may imply that those are my favorites for the Kentucky Derby this year. Okay, well, I think I have a good feel for the audience. <laughs> uh, there's one C and all the rest are S. So, <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not a teacher, so don't have to worry about it. Okay, what I'm going to try to do is give you a little background on the Kentucky regulatory structure and some other regulatory issues with regard to the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. Bob did a good job giving a historical analysis and touched on some, some very important issues. And last night when I, when I practiced this, my initial presentation took an hour and a half. So uh, I'm going to say that Bob covered most of what I had covered in my practice session, at least. And I'm going to cut that out and try to focus on the major issues. And if there's other time, I'll come back and cover some of the less important matters and then open up uh, for questions for both of them. Okay. The, the, the major uh, powers of the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission are provided by statute. The, there's two there's two sections that really impact it. It's for those of you who are taking notes, and I don't think anybody is, so <laughs> you might just have to remember. KRS 230-215, section one and two. Really kind of a poorly written statute, to tell you the truth. I don't know why there are two sections, but they run on so long, I guess they figured out they had to divide it in two instead of putting it all in one. But, uh, the, the regulations that the legislature has promulgated, um, set forth some policies, public policies, and some goals. Those include to encourage legitimate occupations and industries in the Commonwealth, to promote and conserve public health, safety, and welfare, 
to encourage horse breeding in the Commonwealth and to encourage the improvement of breeds of horses. Interesting because the Racing Commission, you know, concentrates on racing, but there are some indications we have responsibilities on the breeding side also. To foster and encourage the business of legitimate horse racing, with paramutual racing thereon in the Commonwealth on the highest possible plane. Uh, the, the statutes declare all racing not licensed is a public nuisance. And I think Bob talked about that. That's why you can't go to Jessica County <coughs> on a racetrack, uh, because it would be declared a public nuisance and may be enjoined as such. And we actually had a case in Northern Kentucky where somebody tried to open up a racetrack. Didn't advertise it too well, uh, but they were conducting races. We had to declare the public nuisance to get an injunction. Um, the other thing that is set forth in the statute is the conduct of horse racing, participation in horse racing, and entrance or presence at racing venues is a privilege and not a right, and one which may be denied by the Kentucky horse racing. So, I, that gets into some of the discussion that, that Bob had in his presentation. Uh, the, the statutes also go further and provide kind of a scope of control of the Racing Commission. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because, frankly, it's very long, but it, I, I want to try to give you some feel for the powers that the Racing Commission the statute said it is the purpose and intent to vest in the Racing Commission forceful control of horse racing in the Commonwealth. I, I don't think there's any definition of forceful control, so uh, we choose to uh, kind of uh, describe it or kind of analyze it in terms of as much control as we can possibly have. Uh, it goes on and talks about with plenary power to promulgate administrative regulation, prescribing in plenary, I think it's complete. I did look that up in the meeting because I didn't, didn't know for sure. And all this time, I haven't known how much power we have. Um, under which legitimate horse racing and wagering thereon is conducted in the Commonwealth, so as to encourage the improvement of the breeds of horses in the Commonwealth, to regulate and maintain horse racing, of the highest quality, and this is this is interesting too. Uh, the the horse racing is supposed to be free of any corrupt, incompetent, dishonest, or unprincipled horse racing practices. Now this is this is this is the power grant in the statute. And one interesting thing is, since it is statutory, and since all the state statutes vary among the thirty-eight racing. In my mind, something that is decided in West Virginia, you, you still have to look at what the Kentucky statute is, because I think there is significant difference. So, we got a lot of power, uh, and we always exercise it well, and very fairly. And Bob's probably dying at this point. Um, but let me go on and point out a couple of other things. Uh, the regulation of horse racing is primarily a matter of state law. And there are 38 different racing jurisdictions, all of whom have different statutes, different regulations. But there is one place where there is a federal statute that has a significant impact upon the horse racing industry. And this is the Interstate Horse Racing Act of 1978. In, in 1975 or so, if you wanted to place a bet on a, on a race horse, and it was a horse at Belmont. You had to get on a plane and fly to New York, get on the train at Penn Station, ride out to Belmont, and place your bet. You may only be there two minutes, but five minutes or whatever, but that's the, with few exceptions, that was the way that you could place a bet in 1975. After that time, when the Interstate Horse Racing Act came into effect, the, the effect of it was to allow the interstate transmission of information regarding gambling. And it's kind of a strange way of, of getting it. 
but that allowed tracks to uh, transmit information. Keeneland, for example, could take information on its races, you know, the post positions, the horses that were entered, uh, the, the odds and things like that, and transmit that to Belmont. And then Belmont could have people come out to Belmont and, and bet on a race at Keeneland. And the bets that were made in Belmont and Keeneland and whatever other jurisdictions allowed those types of bets would be pooled. And the money, you know, the odds are determined pooling both bets in Belmont and bets in Keeneland. The, the effect of it has been, uh, there's a couple different effects. Um, one is that the live betting at racetracks since that act went into effect has declined significantly. You, you know, if you, if you don't really want to spend a whole afternoon in Keeneland, uh, you can sit in front of your TV set, watch TVG, you get on Twin Spires, which is an ADW, and you can you can load money into your account at Twin Spires and go ahead and bet whatever tracks that Twin Spires covers. So the effect has been a negative effect upon the uh, live handle at racetracks. However, when you look at the amount of betting, the total handle that includes off-track bets, simulcast bets, and all the different kind of other kinds of uh, betting, the actual overall handle has gone up. So I think the effect of the act has expanded in some ways the total amount of betting and maybe allocated more of it to the electronic betting than to the live betting. It's, it's gotten to the point where I think, not sure we're quite there yet, but I think you can uh, go to Keeneland and bet on the uh, Epsom Derby. And you can go to McCarthy's Pub at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning and watch the Epson Dart. So it's, it's pretty extensive changes in the way people bet, the ability to bet in different ways, and the, and the amount of the betting. The other thing that came out of the Interstate Horse Racing Act is the, there are certain conditions precedent for allowing the information to be transferred back and forth between tracks for the tracks to take those bets. One of the things that has to happen is there has to be a, a, uh, an approval of the racing commission in the state where the race is going to be run and the state where there is a receiving track. So if you're running a race uh, at Keeneland and you want Belmont wants to televise the race and take bets on it. The racing commissions in both Kentucky and New York have to approve uh, ahead of time. That's not hard to get because you know, the racing commissions are uh, looking for promoting business, promoting the racing business. So why wouldn't you go ahead and approve it? The other thing, however, is it also requires the approval of the race tracks and the horsemen's groups at the track. Now, horsemen's covers trainers and owners, but uh, it's primarily trainers. So the effect of requiring, and, and again, it's both states. So if that, taking that same bet, the Kentucky uh, horsemen and the, church, and the uh, Keeneland uh, employees have to approve an agreement ahead of time as do the horsemen and the track at Belmont. The effect of that, and this is editorial, so this is certainly not the racing commission at this point, but the effect of that is essentially the horsemen have been granted a veto right because if they withhold the approval to do an interstate bet, then that bet cannot be made. And there are a number, you know, it, it's essentially labor arbitration that govern some of those. And it's a matter of private contract. It's not the racing commission. It's a private contract between the track <coughs> and the horseman's group. And there are a number of cases, but I imagine they're cited in your book, Bob, a number of cases where the horseman withheld approval 
And there's some where the track is kind of lit down the through because it's a, it's a question of the uh, relative economic bargaining power. Where approval is withheld, uh, for example, I think right now there's in, uh, in Florida, you can't bet on a Kentucky track because I think that the Florida horsemen have withheld approval. So uh, there are kind of anomalies. And of course, the big time that comes right before the Derby, when if you don't get the approval, then you miss a safe racing day. So that there's a lot of activity in this area right before the Derby. So I, I just I wanted to point that out because that's about the only place where the federal government has some input into the racing industry. The rest of the uh, regulations are state regulations. I'm going to skip licensing and a few other things like that. I want to talk a little bit about paramutual wagering regulation. Uh, this is this is an interesting area, and I never understood it until, gosh, maybe it was 20 years ago, and I was speaking with a gentleman named John Cashman, who was president of Red Mile, and he was talking about a big race coming up at Red Mile on Saturday, and he said that there was a horse running to be a three to five favorite, and I thought, ah, you know, that horse wins, the track loses a lot of money, and he said, no. I don't care who wins or loses. I just want people to bet. And so what he what he was telling me, what I finally grasped, grasped and understood is the track is really a facilitator of the bets. You're not because it's paramutual, when you place a bet, you're not betting against the house like you do with Las Vegas. And I see some people who obviously in the Las Vegas nodding and they understand this. And these two right here, right? Because the Vegas head. Um, what you're doing is you're betting against everybody else who's betting on that race. And the amount of money you get back and the odds are determined by who's betting on that race, not, not the track. What the track gets is the track gets a cutout. And, and I think the uh, in Kentucky, at least, depending on the percentage, it's somewhere around 16%, to maybe 22%. And then the state takes its cut, and there's distribution to purses and things like that. So it gets spread out. But because it's paramutual, you know, the track is interested in volume. The track is not interested in who wins and who loses. Now, I, I mentioned this because I never understood it until 20 years ago. So I'm, I'm assuming somebody in the audience. But it, it also leads into an analysis of uh, something that the Horse Racing Commission has done probably in the last four years that has kind of changed the landscape uh, in Kentucky. And that is to adopt uh, historical horse racing or instant racing, whichever, whichever term you decide to use. A few years ago, uh, Attorney General Jack Conway gave an opinion of the Attorney General that said the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission had the power to implement historic racing without having to have a state statute to do it. Now this, this was a pretty important thing. At, at that point in time, there had been a number of efforts to try to get a casino bill uh, approved legislature, none of which went very far. Um, so this was something the Racing Commission looks at and says, ah, you know, historic racing, we can't get anything through the legislature, maybe we can do it on our own. So we decided to embark on uh, what was somewhat of a struggle, and continues to be a struggle, to implement his historical horse racing. The Racing Commission developed this product out of whole cloth. There wasn't any form around to go to. We had to promulgate regulations, but there was only one state that had the product, which is Arkansas. And, and frankly, in Arkansas, politics were such that Oakland Racing Track could get anything it wanted through the legislature. So it wasn't a very fair review of the regulations. 
I have to uh, tip my hat at this point to Tim West, who's here today. Tim was counsel with the Racing Commission. He's the scripter of the regulations that allowed us to employ uh, to implement historical racing. And I appreciate that very much. Um, so we did go ahead and pass regulations. Uh, historical racing has been implemented at Kentucky Downs Racetrack, which is in Franklin, Kentucky. Uh, it's at about 45 minutes maybe from Nashville. And my understanding is it's almost like Atlantic City used to be. They're running buses back and forth from you know, shopping centers in Nashville to, to Franklin. It's also been implemented at Ellis, and it's, it's not doing quite as well at Ellis. There's a proposal that I expect to be implemented by uh, sometime next year, where uh, students from UK and UK law school will be able to walk to the Red Mile Race <coughs> and play historical racing. Uh, I, I hope for anybody on the staff here, I'm not suggesting encourage that, I'm just <laughs> stating it as, as a fact. Um, the relationship with paramuture later is, if it was a slot machine, and you were playing against the house, so if you went to the to Red Mile, and you either won or the track won, it would not be paramuture. And in that case, the racing commission would have no jurisdiction. So the way the games are organized, there is a machine that, and this is not for publication, looks a little like a slot machine. And you know, you can pull the lever, but you pick out who you want to bet on, and there's a limited amount of information. These races are all historical. They've been running 50, 75 years ago, and they're in the database. So you pick it out, they give you a probably the last sixteenth of a mile they show on the machine and then it's determined whether you won or not. So the results of the race, if you pick the winner, you win. But the amount of money you get can vary widely, even on the same race, because you're playing against the other people who are playing that race and the, those machines at that track at the same time. It's not even pooled with other tracks. So it is paramutual. It is something that we believe the Racing Commission was entitled to do. We have gone all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has ruled that it is, it is paramutual wagering. They, uh, in fairness, they did remand back to Franklin Circuit Court for further discovery, because uh, I can't get into the, the structure of the process of the litigation, but there was very little discovery that was taken up front. And this was called an agreed case. And I'm not sure what that is, but that's what my lawyers do. So, uh, you know, an editorial comment impeding or, improve, impeding or improving, you know, I'd say that uh, the adoption of historical racing by the uh, Kentucky Horse Racing Commission has certainly improved racing in Kentucky. I've got brought some numbers with me. The first track opened historical racing in September of 2011. These numbers are from September 2011 through December 2014. Total amount of wagers, so this would be both Kentucky Downs and Ellis Park, is $850 million. Of that amount, the tracks have received $53 million for their profit. Purse account, which is the amount of money that goes to uh, allocations to horses that win races, uh, has increased by $13 million. So that, that's the thing that has really helped racing is there's more purse money out there now than there was before in storage racing. So, and, and I want to say I'm, I'm while I'm passionate about the horse business, I'm not prejudiced at all about the historic horse race. Actually, I'm pretty proud of it. Okay. Um, I think I'm almost out of time, but there's two other things I'd like to, like to point out. And one is, uh, one involves uniform medication. Bob spoke about that a little bit. 
it is very difficult to analyze, assess, and put together the medication for <coughs> racing states in the U.S. We have 38 different racing jurisdictions, and I venture to say there are maybe five years ago there were 38 different statutes. If you raced in Indiana one day and then raced 30 days later in Florida, you might be under completely different medication. So you can imagine that for trainers, for horsemen and owners, it's very difficult to work with a, a somewhat Byzantine structure you know, of medication. As a result, the uh, RCI, Racing Commission of Jersey International, has, uh, it's, it's a trade association composed of the racing commissioners from those 38 states. And they promulgated a uniform set of medication rules and suggested uh, to the racing states that they adopt those regulations. Kentucky has adopted those. I believe there are now 11 or 12 states that have adopted those. And, and they, it's a real improvement because at least in those states, there's a uniform set of rules that is, uh, is helpful for the trainers and the horses to follow. Now, that's not the end of the story on medication. Medication is a huge issue in the racing, in the racing area. Uh, as a result of the fact that there are still 20, 26 states or 27 states that have not adopted uniform medication rules, there is a push underway to either amend the Interstate Horse Racing Act or change and have a new act that would provide a federal organization that would have oversight of drug regulations, drug testing, drug labs in the horse industry. It's, it's uh, being spearheaded by the Jockey Club. I'm not sure where it will go, but it is it's a significant issue now. The reason it's a significant issue is uh, specifically one drug, Lasix, which is race day medication. It is the only drug that is allowed, only medication, excuse me. I'm supposed to be talking about medication. Uh, it's the only medication that is allowed in the system horse system on race day. The U.S. is the only country in the world that allows Lasix on race day. Uh, the effect of that is that you know nobody really knows too much about the science behind it. It, it does help prevent the horse from bleeding, so in that way it is therapeutic to an extent. It's also a diuretic, so you know my 92-year-old dad is on Lasix, and it, it you know cleans out your system to the extent where some of the studies indicate that the amount of weight you lose, water weight, in a race or horse is somewhere between 10 and 90 pounds. Now, you know the handicap in the system in horse racing is based on weights allocation of weights in an effort to try to make a, better, a, a level play. <coughs> the fact that the diuretic changes those weights means that a horse does better uh, or the, the performance is improved if you race on Lasix because you lose the water weight. There are those who would disagree with my position on this and I don't want to don't indicate that I'm, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. But there's a substantial number of people who are concerned about and industry participants that are concerned about this. And so you may be hearing in the next couple of years more talk about some type of federal legislation that will impact this. And actually, uh, their, their specific proposal is to put all the testing and medication rules under USADA U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, which is the agency that regulates uh, drug testing and medication for the Olympic U.S. Olympic uh, uh, Olympic Committee, and it is the group that that caught Lance Armstrong and finally nailed Lance Armstrong. 
And it's a very, very interesting story. The gentleman who's in charge of USADA is a guy named Travis Tiger. I've met him a couple of times. And, you know, he had death threats against them and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty interesting. I think I'm getting a little far afield. But hopefully I've given you a little background on the structure <coughs> of the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission, the source of the power and authority, and some of the kind of hot issues that are going on at this time. Thank you. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Well, I have two, I, I got two questions. One, where do I get a LASIK prescription? Um, more substantively, could you talk for a minute about uh, you've got the jockey clubs and these other kind of, in my world, to call SRO, self regulatory yeah. organization. Right. There, there are private groups of people setting rules which impact an industry. Can you talk about their relationship to antitrust? Which may be outside of no. regular. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can I can at least it's uh, it's an interesting area. I can at least identify the fact that, that there are antitrust issues about private organizations. The Jockey Club is a private organization that registers horses, uh, thoroughbred horses. So if you have a thoroughbred horse, in order to race or in order to have your progeny of that horse eligible for inclusion with registry, you have to register. So it it has, that's the power that it has, that's what it does. But there are questions about that group, for example, there are questions about RCI, which is really just uh, comes up with uniform rules and suggests them. But there are questions about whether or not those groups have have sufficient power, or are they violating antitrust rules by promulgating some regulation? And that's that's about all I can give you, Tom. I don't know the law behind it, but I certainly know there are questions. And I think you're part of those laws now. Yes. One of our online participants has a question for you. Okay. Uh, what is your What are your thoughts on the creation of a national racing commission to govern all racing? Similar to USEF, I, I think it uh, it's an it's an idea that has some merit. Uh, the, I think it's a widely held belief in the industry that the horse racing industry suffers by reason of not having a national office that has some broad powers over the industry. And there are analog analogies drawn to the NFL, to NASCAR, that are kind of centralized organizations. While I think it is an idea that has some merit, I, I frankly don't see it ever happening. And the reason is uh, that the horse industry has so many disparate parts. Breeding has maybe one viewpoint. People who race have another viewpoint. Vets have a viewpoint, the, you know, the trainers have a viewpoint. I don't see substantial uh, support coalescing anytime in the near future for a, for a national office. Thank you. I think Bob's open for questions too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so my talk is, uh, or my comments, I'm going to jump around a little bit because what I'm trying to do is cover uh, topics that are not addressed by racing and regulation. So it may seem like my talk's a little ADHD, which for those of you, there's a few of you in the audience that know me, none of that will be a surprise. <laughs> um, the other thing is I've never really tried to give a talk where I read off my iPad. So um, the first thing I wanted to give uh, mention was and the um, question from the online audience just raised it, which is private associations and the fact that they offer an entirely different regulatory oversight for what they do. And, and one of the great examples is USEF, which is the United States Equestrian Federation. And coincidentally, their general counsel is sitting in the audience. So I don't get to just make whatever comments I want today, but I'm just kidding. They're really 
a tremendous example of private regulation. And what's very different about those associations, those trade associations, and those governing bodies that govern either horse sport or breed associations, <coughs> excuse me, breed associations, is that they're private. They do not have this state actor sort of umbrella over them, which says, oh, you might be subject to certain constitutional provisions, or you may have to answer to other bodies or state government, they're truly private. And if you look at the case law for USCF and its predecessor name, which is the American Horse Show Association, you'll see several lawsuits, particularly when they were located in New York, regarding how much private action they can take and the extent to which they can govern their own members. And it's pretty all-encompassing. They have the right, as Bob was talking about, exclusion. They have the right to exclude people from their events if they've done something to they, um, <clears throat> breach the rules. And you can look at, there's a quite well-known case, um, Barney Ward's case in New York, where he received a lifetime exclusion from USCF, including not being able to <clears> that <throat> those exclusions encompass any event or training area for USCF, so you can't even go on the showgrounds, much less show. And he had a son who was competing for the Olympic team, and he was excluded from even going to watch it. And that was upheld by the courts. They have their own complete set of rules, which has a hearing committee. Um, you go, you, if there's a rule violation, either just a strict rule or a medication issue, you go in front of the hearing committee, they hear the case, it's, it's like an administrative hearing, or it is an administrative hearing, but the rules of evidence um, don't really apply. You can bring in hearsay and whatever evidence you have, and they'll, <coughs> excuse me, they um, will hear that case and make a decision. There's really no right of appeal, although there have been lawsuits trying to challenge that. The, the rules are what the rules are, and those associations have the right to administrate as they see fit. Those rules and regulations encompass everything from the rules of the horse shows, sportsmanship, permissible tag, qualifications, pony measurements, stewards, judges. Things that they don't do, they don't settle disputes between their members. So if you're owed money or you have a dispute in a horse sale, those associations do not um, try and get in the middle of that. That's a private right for litigation. They also have as Bob was talking about the absolute insurer rule, they have a similar rule there where if a horse has a drug positive, you're basically presumed guilty. Um, you get to go have your hearing, you can put on your evidence, but at the same time, it's really a zero tolerance um, organization, so zero tolerance for medications. Um, you do, of course, have the right to put your case on, and, to, and then it really becomes more about penalties and what penalties might apply. The second thing I wanted to talk about is racing partnerships and syndicates and how there's a regular there's regulatory oversight to those as well. And so those of you that are familiar with those, um, the general, what I'm talking about is securities regulations. So racing partnerships are typically set up as LLCs or partnerships. They have a centralized management. I don't know how many of you taken securities regulation already with Fifth Campbell or someone else, but there's generally this Howey test, which talks about um, centralized management, pooling of income, expectation of profit and, invest and, and investment. And so when you think about people investing in racing partnerships, you've got a group of individuals who are investing in a racehorse. There's typically a racing manager. They're typically formed as LLCs. <clears throat> and that manager controls the activities of the racing partnership. So you can see where it starts to fit the elements of an investment contract and a security. So um, there have been multiple requests to the SEC for no action letters with racing partnerships and various different structures. But in general, the SEC considers these to be securities. So that's an area where you might not have thought about <coughs> federal regulation in the horse business that exists. <coughs> Contrasting that with stallion syndicates, back what what year was the John Gaines no action letter? Seventy seven, something like that. 
So stallion syndicates in the in the past, so let's talk about the mid 70s, were formed. They still are formed today as co-ownership agreements. But back in the 70s, if I bought excuse me, if I bought an interest in a stallion syndicate, I was typically breeding my own mare to that particular stallion. And the reason I bought a share in, or a fractional interest in the syndicate was I wanted to have access to that stallion. And so at that time. John Gaines sent, or his counsel sent a no action letter request to the SEC. And they described this, the structure of stallion syndicates at that time, which was they were typically 40 share syndicates or 40 fractional interests. The horse was basically divided into fractional interests. They were co ownership agreements rather than partnerships, where you were tenants in common of a chattel. And so, he put forth this request for a no action letter, which said, here's the structure. We have 40 shares. I bring my own mare to the stallion. Um, we have a syndicate manager that manages the horse. But in general, your result, Tom owned a share in the stallion. His result was um, determined by the poll and had the quality of the poll that resulted. And therefore, it was individual to him whether he made a profit or whether it was a good investment. Him, but it wasn't determined by how well the overall structure fit. What's different today from when John Gaines did receive a no action letter, where the SEC at that time said we don't consider this to be a security, is that today, with changes in um, veterinary care, animal husbandry with the stallions, there's this ability to um, have that stallion cover many more mares than they did in the past. And so today we see, now that you mentioned the, down, the downturn in the thoroughbred industry over the past few years, but there was a time around 2007, 2008, when some of these stallions in central Kentucky were covering as many as 200 mares, northern hemisphere. And that was, you know, they were standing to three mares a day, sometimes more, but it, and it depended on what farm you were associated with. But the typical stallion syndicate or stallion will now cover between 100 mares as high as at some point 200 mares and that's northern hemisphere and then these stallions are also now shuttling to the southern hemisphere so in the opposite side of the calendar they're going to, to argentina or chile or australia and they're covering another possibly 100 mares down there in addition because they can cover so many more mares we're now structuring the syndicates with more fractional interest so you have stallions, you have the syndicate set up now with typically 60, 70, 80 shares or 80 fractional interests being sold. <clears throat> and then because, you know, how our economy has changed and with investments in the industry, et cetera, you have some people investing in stallion syndicates that don't own their own mares. They're investing so that they can sell the annual nomination and make money over time. They're speculating on potential for that stallion to increase in value and be able to sell their share down the road. And then in addition, um, you've got more, you may have people breeding, um, they'll breed, they'll use their share in Northern Hemisphere, but then when that stallion goes Southern Hemisphere, it creates more income. So what you make, what you do have now is more income and more outside mares going to the stallion. There's pooling of income, there's centralized management, and so there's an argument now that those stallion syndicates are looking more and more like securities. <clears throat> so one of the ways um, the drafters of these stallion syndicates uh, were to structure them as, as co-owners of the horse, which makes it seem somewhat less like a security. Um, the syndicate manager is not, does not have to sell nominations and does not have to pool income. That's up to the individual syndicates. But you can see where as the industry has changed, the structure of these, or, of these syndicates has changed, the way they're managed has changed. And so that can have an impact on how regulators may look at them. Something else to consider about the difference between racing partnerships and stallion syndicates is the racing partnerships. You know, you have a horse out on the track, the investors in those partnerships or LLCs don't have much control over what's going on. And so having them form as LLCs is preferable or partnerships so that you have that additional layer of liability protection. 
with stallion syndicates, if you think about it, people ask all the time, why aren't they formed with LLCs? And, um, and you, you could certainly form them with LLCs, but one of the things to think about is that horse <coughs> is limited to that farm where he's standing, and there's a professional farm manager there, and so both the horse is insured, and the farm certainly has general liability insurance, and so the risk to investors in stallion is less in terms of having liability themselves. Okay, one more thing I wanted to talk about, which sort of ties into Bob Beck's discussion, which is this federal oversight of horse racing and online wagering. And so Bob talked about the Interstate Horse Racing Act, so I don't need to cover that. But one of the things that that um, the Interstate Horse Racing Act was passed in 1978, which permitted the transmission of data across state lines, which permitted um, simulcasting and wagering. And then that statute was amended again in 2001 to expressly permit telephone and internet wagering, which created for the horse industry, um, at least for the time being, a monopoly on legal online wagering in the United States. There's a lot of pressure, as you probably have read in the media, for online poker, online casinos, et cetera, which would further, which would infiltrate that market. But for now, none of those are permitted. So that act was amended to expressly permit that. And as Bob mentioned, <coughs> in 78 or 77 before that act, 100% of all wagering was done on track. And that's changed so dramatically with the Interstate Horse Racing Act and the advent of simulcasting and online wagering that now 90% of all wagering is done off track in different locations. So it's made, had a major impact on horse racing and, and the economics of horse racing. One of the things I wanted to mention that um, Bob brought up federal oversight and the fact that there's really this one federal act. There's one federal act in favor of horse racing and in favor of wagering, which is the Interstate Horse Racing Act. There are something like eight or nine criminal acts that are sort of against gaming, and we have this long standing um, cultural adversity to gambling in the United States. And so you see that with the, the Wire Act, the um, there's a the Travel Act, there's, some, there's an act about wagering paraphernalia being transported across state lines. And so, as Bob talks about instant racing and an advent of other kinds of gaming that support horse racing, it's always done <clears throat> with this backdrop of federal, this sort of um, negativity about gambling that we have as a culture that you don't see in other countries. In Australia and the United Kingdom and other countries, they're very pro gaming. And so it's a, that's a very unique thing to the US and to a probably lesser extent, somewhat in Canada. But there are numerous federal anti gambling acts that, oh, that sort of play in the background of horse racing. <coughs> Excuse me. For a long time, the Department of Justice took the position that the Interstate Horse Racing Act did not um, supersede the, Inter the um, Wire Act. And so the DOJ took the position that, in fact, interstate simulcasting or wagering across state lines was illegal under the Wire Act, even though it was expressly permitted under the Interstate Horse Racing Act. It just maybe three years ago that the DOJ finally came out with a statement issued an opinion which was actually done to support on the state online lottery sales, which said the Wire Act is really just about sports sports betting, and it's limited to sports betting. So that's been a big relief for the horse racing industry not to have to kind of still play this game with DOJ, where DOJ would, would bring up once in a while, but oh, by the way, we think summer casting is illegal, <laughs> and they would bring it up in the sports betting cases where the offshore operator perhaps was also betting on horse racing or huh. taking wagers on horse racing. Let me stop there. Okay. Um, <laughs> what? Nice job. Yeah. <laughs> so, the one other thing I wanted to mention is the 2006 Unlawful Gambling Enforcement Act, which it's U I G E A, and there's no good acronym for how to say it, but that act was passed, um, and people, you know, and even the title of it, it's part of the Safe Harbor Act that was passed at the last minute in that legislative session federally, which was supposed to be about post 9 11 port security. And as we literally around like 
Mississippi at night on the last day of the session, they appended that <clears throat> act to include this unlawful gambling enforcement act. And you would that it sounds like that would have something to do with prohibiting online gaming or gambling in general, but really what the act does is it puts all the onus on the banks and the credit card companies to monitor um, movement of money. And so what happened was legitimate online wagering companies like Churchill Downs or ExpressBet and others, MasterCard and Visa started coding those transactions as they were coded as gambling. And even though they were legal gambling, they got shut down. And so there was a lot of lobbying, as you can imagine. And so the, the credit card companies have now been recoding legitimate gaming transactions, but it's still an ongoing struggle uh, to, so for a lot of ADW operators, advanced deposit wagering companies that are smaller, when they try and set up their accounts, they need a lot of resistance from the bank, from the various banks to transmitting money, either internationally or within the state or between states. Now, one of the interesting things that came out of that act, that the NFL and the NBA and other sports organizations lobbied for, um, during that amendment to carve out an exception for fantasy, fantasy sports. And if you think back to that time, ESPN and other organizations were running season-long uh, fantasy sports contests, and mostly they were non-cash. They were all, for sure, season long, and, and it's often described as a game of skill where you have to have a lot of background or play fantasy sport, um, as opposed to just pure chance gaming like you might see at a casino. And so they carved out this exception. It's one or two lines that says this whole thing doesn't apply to fantasy sports. What's come of that is that that started off with leagues like ESPN, which were no entry fee, and you might get a prize at the end, but it wasn't a cash issue, and it was a season-long contest. And what's come of that in an incredibly rapid way is are these daily cash contests. So it's moved from a season-long contest to sometimes daily contests. And if you look at companies like FanDuel, they're doing something like, um, like 10 million a day or 100 million a week or something crazy like that in cash, they're still saying that they're fantasy because you're creating your league that day or you're, or you're predicting the outcome of various sports events that day. But there's cash going in and there's cash coming out. It's extremely significant. So one of the sort of, I think, unpredictable results of the UIGEA is that it's created this amazing online gaming situation that is still under the guise of fantasy sports, but I think it's, there's been a lot of discussion in the literature and on the radio and other sports commentators about whether there may in fact be any post in action in that case. So, anything else? Question? I have one. Do you have one? I have one. <laughs> Could you, um, Kentucky has editorial and really ridiculous law and dual agencies and decline sales. And I was just wondering if you could comment on it. I, I, the law generally says thou shalt not represent both sides of the deal, and if you do, you're subject to trouble damages. But then it says it doesn't apply to transactions for less than $10,000. So the people who are getting into the industry for the first time, they don't get any protection. And you can say, well, I didn't know there was a law that says I couldn't do that, so I'm not liable. So you have a knowledge of improper conduct defense. Why? <laughs> That's a good question. And maybe one of our state legislators. Blame the legislature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, everybody else does. <laughs> the, uh, no, but I think they're disposed to go. They have to sort of dispose this tool even for less than that threshold amount. And um, they just figure it less than that is not worth it. The rumor, the rumor was that there was a state legislator from Western Kentucky who wanted to exempt out Tennessee walking horse transactions for the most part, or other smaller breed. But again, and then, you know, Tom's right that for ten thousand dollars, let's say the horse was five thousand dollars, it's hard to bring that to litigation because your cost of litigation and your exceed the cost of the transaction. 
and yet those are the people that need some protection. But I think what Tom was also leading to at the beginning of the question is that statute, that already was a law. You know, the law is a principle and agency, which um, we've all learned in business associations, that's already the law, that you cannot attack on both sides of the transaction without disclosure. You can cure it with disclosure. But now, and this all comes out of the Just Jackson um, thoroughbred case, so there are similar statutes now in California and Florida regarding um, <coughs> written bills of sale and disclosing of dual agency. Um, and I, I know California also has trouble damages, I'm not sure about Florida. But it came out of this Jess Jackson case where his agent, he alleged that his agent had purchased a significant amount of horses on his behalf for a lesser price and then priced it him at a look at it much greater price and kept pocketed the difference and was getting a commission from the seller and then was effectively taking a very large commission from Mr. Jackson. In addition, Mr. Jackson was probably paying him a commission. So that case was litigated and ultimately settled. We don't know what the result was if it was confidential. But the, Mr. Jackson's efforts in the late state legislature and others, um, the result of which was this statute, which is similar to what California has. I probably read the statute that if the transaction is less than $10,000, otherwise mandatory disclosure is not mandated by the statute. But it just seems to me that this is a place where supposedly the legislature was stepping in to regulate. And then they said the people who most need to be protected don't get any protections from it. And if the common law of agency was now you cannot represent both sides of the deal. This one is saying, well, you can under certain situations, but if it's below a threshold, you don't get that protection. So is that saying you may do it? Again, it, 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 it just seems to be an analytic failure at that point. Or an arbitrary. They well, just, they just decided to cut it off somewhere and keep what they thought, I guess, with the small stuff from out of the corporate. There was, I remember, I wasn't in the office then, but I remember just Jackson going to Frank. It was like the invasion of Normandy. I mean, this guy was really mad. He had a lot of money, and he hired lobbyists, and he wanted to get a bill passed. And uh, I don't think uh, they, they didn't pass anything like what he wanted, but they, they did put something on the books for a prior to that or what he did. And uh, oh, something, something happened. I hope perfect, but it was something. Yeah. Yeah. It has actually drawn people's attention in the horse industry, particularly the sport horse world, to this concept of putting bills of sale in writing. And it's a very common practice. It was in the thoroughbred industry, and it certainly is in the sport horse world. This dual agency status where people are on both sides of the transaction. And they've been going on for so long that I think they just thought that was normal and that it was okay. You know, they're not students of the law and they haven't taken principal and agency, but so it was good to bring it all to the forefront. There was there were a lot of articles written about it, you know, and uh, I'm not aware of too many of litigation that have resulted from it, but I think it did draw people's attention to the being an issue. Um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned there's a community market for bringing Diane to Dr. Could you talk at all about how you're not just very long with my interest in that? Okay. You know, I don't I, I do not know a ton about that. If there is there's a very big industry regarding quarantines and imports and exports and horse transportation. Um, I'm sure they all, you know, pay income tax on the revenues, et cetera, but I don't know about international trade. Does anybody else know anything about that? Some, some, uh, some of the some of the issues run into are the import export restrictions. So you have you end up quarantining a horse maybe in Miami if it's going to Argentina, and then it may have to be quarantined at the other end too. And it's a matter of complying with the uh, uh, agricultural department rules in the U.S. and the country that it's going to. The tax tax issues are pretty. Interesting, and they vary considerably. Australia, for example, has a fat tax, but there are ways to get around it. It's kind of arcane, so it's difficult to get into. But there, uh, and 
also a lot of the deals where a stallion goes to the southern hemisphere are structured as leases. And so it's not an outright sale. And the theory at least is if you if you lease the horse and the southern hemisphere partner picks the horse up at the farm in Kentucky and is required to make payment in Kentucky before the horse ever leaves. And the situs of the transaction is Kentucky. And so there is no, you know, there is taxable income in Kentucky, but there's no tax to the lessor in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, does that always work? I don't know. But, I, you know, I haven't had a back part on it yet. But, you know, it could. <laughs> but there, there's a whole body of, of things that you have to think about. And that raises another uh, topic of equine tax, which is a whole area unto itself. Uh, there are certain sales tax exemptions in various states, including Kentucky. Kentucky has a specific exemption for breeding stock uh, for sales tax, but not for the sale of a nomination to a stallion each season. So if you buy a stud, you send your mare to a stallion and pay a stud fee, that is subject to sales tax. Um, there's a significant case law development um, within the equine industry on hobby lots and passive lots and what is considered a business and what is not considered a business and when do you have material participation in the business to be an active investor. Just a whole topic unto itself, but something to be aware of if you practice in the area. Question? Anything else? Well, that brings this morning's session to a close. Uh, we'll be reconvening this afternoon, 115, this same room. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Good job. Yes. 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 Yes.